Welcome to our evening service video. Let's start with prayer. Dear Lord God, we want to thank you for your faithfulness to us throughout this Lord's Day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have already had this day to join with others in worshipping you uh, online. Lord, we thank you for this technology. And we pray that you would be with us again this evening, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would remind us of your goodness to us and of your great love and grace. Uh, that that may stir our hearts afresh to worship you. Lord, help us to give full attention to all that you have to say to us through your word this evening and help us to honour you as we sing your praises and as we read the scriptures. Please be with us in every part of our service tonight, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn this evening is number 160 in Christian hymns. And it's Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. For by his power each tree and flower was planned and made. And the chorus, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, praise him with hallelujahs. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> psalm this evening is psalm 37 although starting from verse 21 psalm 37 from verse 21 to the end the wicked borrow and do not repay but the righteous give generously those the lord blesses will inherit the land but those he curses will be cut off if the lord delights in a man's way he makes his steps firm Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever, for the Lord loves the just 
and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of his God is on in his heart, his feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. But the Lord will not leave them in their power, or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil. But he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace. But all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them, because they take refuge in him. Well, we're going to sing again now, and it's number 152 in Christian hymns. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Next reading this evening is from Haggai. 
Haggai chapter 1. That's one of the really small books right near the end of the Old Testament. So you might want to work your way backwards if you're not familiar with that. Uh, start in Matthew and then flick backwards in your Bible until you get to Haggai. And uh, we're just looking at chapter 1. Uh, Beryl is going to read that for us now. Haggai chapter 1. A call to build the house of the Lord. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. Amen. Thank you, Beryl. We're going to come to God in prayer now, and Paul is leading us in prayer this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence tonight and we do come with praise on our lips and we trust in our hearts for all your goodness to us. That psalm that we read earlier has reminded us of some of your qualities, of your goodness towards us, your unchanging goodness, your faithfulness, your justice, the fact that you are a refuge for your people. You protect us. And we praise you for the inheritance of which that psalm speaks, the inheritance which is laid up for us, as Peter tells us, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. What a wonderful prospect it is for us who are your children. And we do indeed praise you, Father, for this wonderful prospect that we have. And Father, that psalmist was able to say, once I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken. How wonderful that is. And we thank you for those of our brothers and sisters, those known to us, those in this church, who can say that, 
who were young, who are now getting on in years, but who can speak of your faithfulness throughout their lives. We thank you for them, for the way you've preserved them, for the example they are to us. And we pray that as they become more frail, less well, less able to do the things they could do, perhaps a little frustrated, we ask that you will be their comfort and their strength and continue to be a refuge for them. And we pray particularly for those who are ill, draw near to them and give them your comfort, we pray. But as we think of your protection, we pray particularly for those of our brothers and sisters overseas who don't enjoy the same freedoms that we do, those who are persecuted for their faith. We think of those in China, those in North Korea, those in many of the Islamic countries. We ask you to be a refuge for them as well. May they know your protection. May they know wisdom in how to act. Make them, Father, as wise as snakes and yet as harmless as doves. And we pray that you will bless them in their fellowship, sometimes secret fellowship, in their study of your word, that they might continue to grow in the faith. And we pray that in these countries the gospel might continue to spread. And Father, we thank you for ourselves as well. We thank you for your goodness to us as a church. We thank you for the young people. And as we've prayed for the elderly, we pray for the young as well, that they might be firm in the faith, that they might be established, that they might continue in the faith throughout their lives. Lord, look after them, please. They are growing up in a world which is hostile to Christianity. We pray that you will enable them to stand firm for you. And as we approach this Christmas time, we pray for the witness of the church, this church and the churches throughout this country where your word is preached. Bless our outreach, we pray. We ask that you will be with all those who will be preaching your word over Christmas. Give them the words to say that they might communicate that gospel message, a wonderful message, clearly. And we pray that at this time when we looking forward perhaps to the end of the coronavirus in a few months time, but still it's uppermost in people's minds. We pray that there will be many who turn to you. We realize that if they hope only for this life, then their lives will be wasted. Father, have mercy, we pray. Open the hearts of many. Enable them to trust in Jesus. We pray for our own outreach as we have a chance to speak to friends and neighbours and family as we give out calendars. We pray for the quiz which will coming, is coming up. We pray that it will all go smoothly, that the technology will work and that it will be a good time to reach out to families who have connections with the church, but whom we can't meet in person. Father, we pray for your blessing. And Father, we pray that we too might rejoice in our own hearts again at this wonderful Christmas message. We ask, Lord, that it might mean something to us. Yes, we've heard it many times before but we, will pr we pray that it will come to us with a freshness. We pray, Father, for the work that's going on in the prisons at this time. We pray for Jeanette, for David, for all those connected with CPR. We imagine that this will be a time when prisoners really feel the loneliness, the isolation, the, the fact that they're separated from family and loved ones, so we pray, Father, for those who will be praying with them, speaking to them, leading studies with them. We again, Lord, ask for your mercy that there will be those in prisons who will be saved over this Christmas time. So, Lord, we come to you. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We know that we let you down in many ways. Father, please forgive us. Hear our prayers. 
as we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Before we turn to God's word, we're going to sing again. It's number 48 in Christian hymns. God of the covenant, triune Jehovah, marvels of mercy adoring we see, seeker of souls in the councils eternal, binding your lost ones forever to thee. I suspect that we're all familiar to some extent with the difficulty of maintaining enthusiasm for something after an initial burst of activity. Uh, we might experience it say in a DIY project where you start with grand intentions uh, but after a few Saturdays or late nights as the enormity or complexity of what you're doing uh, becomes more clear uh, the motivation flags and uh, a few months or even years later the job still hasn't been finished. Or perhaps we find that our excitement for something starts almost at fever pitch, uh, but as time goes on we're actually quite happy to be distracted by other things because, well, they're less effort and uh, maybe we find other things more personally satisfying. Some people, sadly, will even allow a marriage to fall apart because, well, they say, it's not working for me. And frankly, the effort to make it work when perhaps the husband and wife have different expectations and desires just seems too much compared with enjoying a bit of a thing with a colleague at work or whatever. A covenant relationship, which is what a marriage is, requires work, commitment, determination, perseverance and selfless love to make it work. And that can be tough. Well, as we come to the last of our three minor prophets in this series called Thoughts from Three Minor Prophets, we're looking at Haggai this evening. And here we read about another covenant relationship that was under strain, you might say. The relationship between God and his chosen people. The fault is certainly not with God in any way whatsoever. All the blame for the difficulties lies with his people. And we'll look more closely at that in a moment, but first a bit of background to help us get our bearings. Two weeks ago, 
we looked at Nahum and last week at Zephaniah. We saw that both of these books were just three chapters long and were set basically in the latter half of the 7th century BC, with Zephaniah prophesying probably just after Nahum. Nahum's words were directed largely at the Assyrian capital Nineveh and were spoken sometime after 663 BC, but before 612 when Nineveh was destroyed, uh, but quite probably before 627, uh, which was when Ashurbanipal, the last great king of Assyria, died. While Zephaniah's words were directed largely at Judah and Jerusalem and were spoken during the reign of Josiah. Um, possibly after the discovery of the Book of the Law in 622 BC during the Temple renovations. If you know Judah's history, uh, you'll know that after a number of interventions by the Babylonians at the very beginning of the 6th century BC, with groups of Jews being taken back to Babylon from that time on, Jerusalem was finally reduced to rubble by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC, and most of the remaining people were exiled to Babylon or to the region around Babylon at that time. Well, as we now come to Hag Haggai, we're jumping forward a hundred years or so from Zephaniah's time. So, past the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 and the return of the first exiles from Babylon following King Cyrus of Persia's decree, which was in 538 BC. And so we, we arrive at 520 BC, and in fact to very, four very specific dates in 520 BC uh, here in Haggai, in the second year of King Darius's reign. Those four dates are the 29th of August, the 21st of September, the 17th of October, and the 18th of December. Now this book has just two chapters and there are only 38 verses so it's a very quick read and it contains four messages from God for the leaders and the people in Jerusalem at that time. The prophet Zechariah was Haggai's contemporary and both are mentioned in Ezra chapter 5 as being used by God to help Zerubbabel the governor and Jeshua or Joshua the high priest in their work of rebuilding the temple. And it's the rebuilding of the temple and its future glory uh, that form the subjects of the first two messages that Haggai brings to Zerubbabel and Joshua and to the remnant who were living in Jerusalem at the time. What I'd like to do this evening is look through this short book, picking out three themes that either present a, a challenge that still comes down to us today or that give us as much pause for thought and fuel for praise today as God's word through Haggai did to the original hearers 2,539 years ago. Well, firstly, I want to think about the theme of priorities. The first message that God sends to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the high priest, is a very challenging one because it highlights the failure of the people of Jerusalem to prioritise the rebuilding of the temple. Um, just for information, Zerubbabel was the grandson of the exiled king Jehoiachin, and Joshua the high priest was a descendant of Levi and the son of Jehozadak, who had been taken captive and deported to Babylonia when Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem in 586 BC. Well, 18 years before the date of this first uh, message from the Lord, the first returnees had arrived, and although within two years, so by 536 BC, Zerubbabel and Joshua had built the altar and laid the foundations for the temple, uh, they faced opposition and became discouraged, and the building work had stopped. As Haggai brings God's first message to the people, it's now uh, the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month, and that's the 29th of August, 520 BC. And we read there that the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And it becomes clear that the initial zeal that had gripped the people 16 years earlier had well and truly waned. Sadly, this wasn't just because of the discouragement of opposition, as we see as we read on. From verse 2, this is what the Lord Almighty says. 
These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? On the one hand, it seems the people had got into a frame of mind in which they justified their inaction on the temple building project by arguing that the, the time wasn't yet right uh, for that work to be resumed. On what basis they argued that, we, we don't know. But on the other hand, in the next word through Haggai, I think the Lord really exposes the reason. They had prioritised sorting out their own houses and, in fact, to a high standard, it seems. Their hearts had evidently grown cold towards the Lord and had turned inward and become focused on themselves and their own lives and their own comfort. What should have been their top priority, re-establishing temple worship in all its fullness, had been relegated and basically put on the back burner. It's not that repairing your own home to make it habitable is wrong, but the people in Jerusalem were clearly going beyond that and by doing so were showing the coldness of their hearts towards God. Towards the God who had been faithful to his promises in preserving them during their time of exile and in bringing them back from exile and enabling them to settle again in Judah. And that's a real tragedy, isn't it? But it's a charge from God that presents us with a challenge too in our day, I think. Perhaps we're very happy indeed to claim the blessings of God's salvation through Jesus. But the way that we live our lives and the decisions that we make about how to spend our time and our money reveal what our true priorities are and what our hearts are really like and whether we've grown cold towards the Lord. Perhaps these times of great disruption during the past nine months have given you an opportunity to fill your Sundays with other things instead of coming to church. Perhaps you've only been bothering to watch one service each Sunday online instead of originally coming to two services in the building. Perhaps you've quite happily skipped a week here and a week there because, well, other stuff has filled up the time and the desire to spend even just an hour watching a service just hasn't been there. Perhaps, as in the parable of the sower with the seed among the thorns, you've allowed the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things simply to push the Lord out. Perhaps, like some in the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, you've forsaken your first love. Look at what the Lord says next through Haggai in verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. That's a phrase that's repeated five times in this short book and clearly needs to be said because this was something that the people simply hadn't been doing. It seems that they hadn't stopped to reflect on their situation. They hadn't given careful thought to their hearts to their circumstances or to God's word. Because if they had, they would have realised that their poor harvests, their struggling cattle and their hard fruitless lives were all aspects of the curses set out for God's people in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. It was God who was withholding the, these material blessings in accordance with the covenant that he had made with the people because they were failing to fulfil their obligations under that same covenant. Look at verse 9. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. The answer to their difficulties was, as God states in verse 8, Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured. They needed to put God first. And so do we. Although we don't live under the Mosaic Covenant, so under those blessings and curses, we do still have a God who disciplines those whom he loves. And if we're truly his children, 
we must be those who give careful thought to our ways, to consider where God and our obedience to his word sit in our list of priorities. The excuse of the people in Haggai's day was, the time isn't right yet. In other words, we want to do all this other stuff and get everything else sorted for my comfortable life. Have you come across professing Christians, I wonder, who are like that? Who say that they love the Lord, but as you look at the choices that they make in life, the things they choose to spend their time and their money on, uh, the frequency with which they choose not to join with others on the Lord's Day at church, or at a midweek Bible study, and so on. And you realise that they have very little desire, really, to serve the Lord, or to dedicate themselves to growing in their love and knowledge of God, or to serving others within the church, or to sharing in the privilege of taking the good news to the community in which they live. It's easy, I suppose, and certainly tempting to think about other people when we hear a challenge like this. But I would suggest that each of us would do well to hear God's word first and foremost as a word to ourselves. Give careful thought to your ways. What's really wonderful in this situation is uh, to read how the people responded in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel, Joshua son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. God enabled them to respond rightly to this challenge. They didn't turn round and start throwing accusations at Haggai. Uh, they didn't tell him to go away. Uh, the Lord softened their hearts and they were able to listen and respond rightly because they recognised that uh, the Lord their God had sent Haggai, that this was a message from God and they feared the Lord and understood that they needed to obey his call to give careful thought to their ways and to prioritise the building of uh, the rebuilding of the temple. Now we don't have a temple to build but we certainly have Christian lives to build and grow and uh, we have a responsibility towards one another within the church to serve each other, to use our gifts to help and support each other, uh, even to challenge or rebuke each other sometimes. But also, of course, we have the Great Commission, the responsibility to take the good news of Jesus to those around us. So we have all of these responsibilities. And those are the things that we ought to be prioritising in our lives. So this is a challenging thought, isn't it? May God grant that we too may have hearts that respond in the same way as the people did in those days. But moving on, the next theme I want to mention is presence by which I mean God's continuing presence with his people, which, in view of the selfishness of the people that we've just been highlighting, I think is staggering, uh, but wonderfully comforting. God gives them this reassurance in verse 13 of chapter 1. And Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. And then as we read on, we see that the Lord demonstrates his presence among the people by giving them the desire to obey his call. Verse 14, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. That's the 21st of September, 520 BC. So how wonderful. The Lord stirred them up. The Lord did this work to give them this desire to uh, now prioritise the rebuilding of the temple. But it may be that as the people got stuck into the work, uh, the older folk among them were lamenting how small and pathetic this new temple seemed compared with Solomon's temple, and that could easily have been a great discouragement to the people, perhaps even causing a sense of despair. This isn't like the olden days, 
It's very tempting, isn't it, sometimes to think like that. And certainly if you read much church history, it can be tempting for us to feel like this today. Look how godless our society is now. Look how weak and feeble the church seems to be in our day. Look how few people are interested in really finding out more about the Lord. And even among those who claim to be Christians, look how little respect is given to his word and little attention is paid to actually putting that word into practice in our lives. We do live in what seem to be very small, almost pathetic days as far as the uh, glory of the church, the glory of God displayed in the church is concerned. But look at the wonderful words of encouragement that the Lord has for his people at, at that moment in history and I think you know we can learn from that for our day from chapter 2 verse 1 on the 21st day of the seventh month so we're now on to the 17th of October 520 the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai speak to the Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel governor of Judah to Joshua son of Jehozadak the high priest and to the remnant of the people ask them who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory how does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So the Lord is acknowledging that uh, you know, they could well feel very discouraged over the current situation. Verse 4 though, But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. See that threefold call to be strong reminds us of um, the beginning of Joshua, doesn't it, in the Old Testament. God gives them this wonderful reassurance, I am with you, declares the Lord. My spirit remains among you. So what are they to do? Work. You just get on and do the work. Don't worry about whether you think it looks grand or not, or whether it's the same as the previous temple. That isn't your concern. Put me first. Prioritise the rebuilding of the temple. I am with you. So you do not need to fear. Isn't that a wonderful uh, reassurance to us as well. It reminds us, doesn't it, of uh, Jesus' words in the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So that's the work we're to do, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So that's the work that goes on within the life of the church, where we receive instruction from God's Word, and we help and support and teach one another. And Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you see Jesus repeats that same promise to his people as the Lord gave to those people in Haggai's day? I am with you. I am with you always. And that is what makes the difference. That's what lifts us from any sense of despair that we may have. God's presence with his people. We must be about the Lord's work, however feeble it may seem, however ineffective perhaps we may feel, because we can remember that the Lord is with us to strengthen and enable us in our work. He cannot and will not break his covenant with us that has been established through the blood of his Son. Remember, we, we are God's people under what you might say is a better covenant, not the Mosaic covenant anymore where sacrifices had to be repeated again and again. The Lord Jesus Christ, in giving of himself, sealed this new covenant with his blood. And God will not break that covenant. This is what I covenanted with you, God said to them. And in effect, he's saying the same words to us as we look to Jesus. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Wonderfully encouraging, don't you think? Well, lastly, I want to mention promise. As is usual among the prophets, God spoke through Haggai not just to call them back to him and to challenge them to remember and keep the covenant that he had established with them, 
but he also encouraged them by reassuring them of his presence with them, as we've just seen, and by making promises to them regarding the future. In particular, what we see in the last part of the second message and the fourth message are promises that point forward to the Messiah and the blessings that would come to God's people through him. And in the third message, promises that God would do what the people cannot do for themselves because of their defilement, because of their sin, which of course ultimately is also a messianic promise. From verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. That's a, a reference to uh, times of judgment. Um, we could say there are two fulfilments at least of that. Um, certainly after the Lord came the first time and uh, an end is, is brought to the old covenant and uh, in a sense judgment is passed upon the Jews. Um, but ultimately the fulfilment is at the end of time when the Lord Jesus comes again. Verse 7, I will shake all nations and the desired of all nations will come. Uh, traditionally that's seen as a reference to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Um, some commentators debate that, but I think that's a, a reasonable um, interpretation. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. The wonderful promises to reassure the people as perhaps they do feel despondent at how pathetic this temple seems to be. God says he's going to fill it with glory. And uh, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Well, in what way could that be true? Because Solomon's temple, the previous one, was very majestic in terms of its appearance, certainly when it was first built. Uh, it didn't look like that by the time the Babylonians came along, of course, because everything had been stripped away, the gold had all been taken and, and so on. But um, how could he say that the glory of this house is going to be greater? Well, ultimately, of course, because Jesus came uh, to, to this very temple actually, although it had been renovated very much by Herod um, in Jesus, before, just, just before Jesus' day. Um, and Simeon, in fact, in the temple when the Lord Jesus is brought as a baby um, into the temple, uh, Simeon talks about the glory of the people of Israel. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the glory of the Lord Jesus, of course, far exceeds the, uh, the glory of all the symbols within that Old Testament temple. And so there is something far greater about the Lord Jesus. And in fact, of course, ultimately the temple points to Jesus. That's why Jesus could talk to the Jews of his day um, and say things like, well, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And of course, he's talking about his own body, his own life. Ultimately, he is the replacement of that physical temple, that particular bit of architecture. Uh, it was just pointing forward to him. And of course, his glory ultimately is even greater still. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. And it is, of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem and then giving his life for his people, being offered as the sacrifice, uh, that peace is possible for all those who trust in him. The third message from verse 10 of chapter 2 may seem a bit strange initially. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, that's the 18th of December now, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says, ask the priests what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil or other food, does it become consecrated? The priests answered, no. So something holy when it touches these other things doesn't transfer that holiness into uh, those unclean things. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body, so now we're starting with something unclean, touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. So 
Holiness can't be transferred to those things that are defiled, but the defiled things can certainly pass their defilement on uh, to holy things and you know, nullify the holiness. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. So there is nothing that these people can do to make themselves holy, to get rid of their defilement. And that's still true of us today. We are those who are defiled, as it were, in God's presence, in God's sight, because of our sin, because of our choice to go our own way and reject God's word and God's rule in our lives. But we can't make ourselves holy any more than the people in Haggai's day could. Their defilement made it impossible to be holy, and that is true for us today. Verse 15, now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. Uh, when anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. So he's reminding them of um, the situation since the, the time when they did lay the foundation of the temple and then everything stopped. You know, give attention. What's happened since then? Well, your crops have been failing. Instead of 20, there were 10 measures. Instead of 50 measures of wine, there were only 20. Verse 17, I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew and hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. If they had read the law, they would have recognised, hang on, these are covenant curses. And the purpose of them is to stir us up to turn back to you, to turn back to God. But they didn't recognise that and they didn't uh, turn back to the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? The answer there to that rhetorical question is no. Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. Think about it. And then he says, from this day on, I will bless you. God simply makes that choice that he is going to do what they cannot achieve. And they're to make a mental note of their past situation. They're to give careful thought to the promised blessing and remember that this is a work of God's grace alone. That when God grants them blessing, once they've restarted the work of the temple, um, building the temple and have completed it, and as God grants this blessing from this day on, I will bless you. They're to call that to mind and think back to the past and acknowledge that it was their fault that the blessings were withheld and that it is only by God's grace that the blessings that they will then experience um, have come to them. Salvation is entirely a work of God's grace and that is absolutely still true today. It is a work of God's grace alone. And then we come to the final message from verse 20, just the last three verses of chapter 2. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. So we're still on the 18th of December. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. So again, remember, this is a time of judgment that's going to come. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So now a, a word of promise that seems to be directed particularly at Zerubbabel, but actually is for the benefit of all of God's people, the encouragement of them all, and down to us today. Zerubbabel, remember we said, was a descendant of David. He was the grandson of Jehoiachin. And uh, in Jeremiah 22, verse 24, uh, God passes a, a judgment or a curse, you might say, on Jehoiachin. Jeremiah 22, 24, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my hand, right hand, I would still pull you off. 
So it seems that seems to be a word that to Jehoiachin saying, right, that promise that was made to the line of David, I'm withdrawing it from you. Well, now through Haggai, it's the, it seems the Lord is reinstating that. He's reversing that curse, you might say. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Zerubbabel, it seems, would be the seal, the, the guarantee that one day the Messiah in the line of David would come. The ultimate overthrow of the nations and kingdoms of the world will come on the day of judgment. That's what that reference to on that day is. So this is a promise that encourages us too, isn't it? Because that day hasn't yet come. Now, the first fulfilment of that promise was, of course, in the coming of the Lord Jesus uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, but the second coming of Jesus is still uh, lays ahead of us. And so that's a great encouragement to us, isn't it? To know of this wonderful promise of the return of the Lord Jesus. As the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 26 to 29, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Who The writer is quoting uh, from Haggai. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So the writer to the Hebrews uh, quotes from uh, this passage and um, the earlier reference as well to uh, shaking the heavens and the earth, and um, sees ultimately in that, yes, the second coming of the Lord and the removal of everything that's temporary, so that all that's left is the unshakable kingdom of God, this spiritual kingdom or the church. Um, and we're receiving that kingdom. And our response should be one of thankfulness and worship. Think of what God has promised to us, his people. Remember that he is present with us by his spirit. And response to these wonderfully encouraging truths May we get our priorities right as we give him thanks and worship him acceptably with reverence and awe, with wholehearted devotion, with obedience and self-sacrificial service, leaving our own well-being in his hands, which is the safest place to leave it, isn't it? It's a challenge to us. Will we lose our lives for Jesus' sake that we might gain them, truly gain them? Or will we be like those, those uh, back in Haggai's day who were busy panelling their own houses, looking after themselves, giving priority to their own lives? Well, may that not be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we have so often have to acknowledge the great challenge that your word presents to us. And as we've thought about the challenge that was brought to the people through Haggai uh, about the priorities that uh, the people living in Jerusalem had and how they had uh, simply prioritized their own lives instead of thinking about the needs of God and the, the temple and, and the temple worship. Lord, it's a challenge to us. Where are you in our list of loves, our list of priorities? Are we truly putting you first? Is that evident? as people look at our lives and the way that we spend our time, the things that we do with our money, uh, the choices that we make day by day and week by week. Is it evident that we are giving you a top priority? Lord, help us to uh, give careful thought to our ways and to consider carefully uh, whether our priorities are right or not. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful encouragement and promise of your presence with your people. And that promise is still relevant to us today, to have your presence with us. And we praise you uh, that ultimately we have uh, the promises that have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, uh, but also promises regarding the uh, permanence of the kingdom and the second coming of the Lord. 
uh, Lord, these can be such an encouragement to us too. So please be at work in our hearts. Help us to be honest in examining where we stand before you. And if we find that we have not given you the right priority in our lives, please forgive us. Please move and stir our hearts as you did the hearts of the people back then so that we may respond rightly to the challenge of your word, that we may worship you and rejoice and give thanks because of your presence with us and because of the wonderful promises that you have made to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our final hymn is uh, Stuart Townend's version of Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. And the chorus that he has added, O fire of God, come burn in me, renew a holy passion, till Christ my deepest longing be, my never-failing fountain. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road leading to the Lamb. Where is that blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is that soul-refreshing view of Jesus and His Word? Oh, fire of God, come burn in me, renew a holy passion, till Christ my deepest longing be, my never-failing fountain. My never-failing fountain What peaceful hours I once enjoy How sweet the memory still But they have left an aching void The world can never fill Oh, fire of God, come burn in me Renew a holy passion Till Christ my deepest longing be My never-failing fountain My never-failing fountain only thee so shall my walk be close with God come and serene my frame so pure a light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb oh fire of God come burn in me Renew a holy passion Till Christ my deepest longing be My never-failing fountain Oh, fire of God, come burn in me Renew a holy passion Till Christ my deepest longing be my never-failing fountain My never-failing fountain May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. 
Thank you for joining us for our service this evening. Um, as you're aware, of course, we're uh, in uncertain times at the moment. Uh, the elders at the church are reviewing each week whether it's feasible for us to meet in person uh, the following Sunday. And uh, next Sunday is the 20th. And uh, we are going to be having our family carol service. But we haven't yet made the decision whether we can have that in the building or whether that will have to be uh, a video online. Uh, we will let all of our contacts know as soon as that decision is made, as soon as we've reviewed the, the situation, whether our tier level has changed and uh, what the level of infections are and so on. Um, and we'll communicate that decision as soon as we can to everyone on our list of contacts. If you're not currently on our list of contacts, but you would like to, to hear that news, then please get in touch. The email address is on the uh, screen at the end and uh, then we can make sure that we send you uh, the information as well. So um, I hope you can join us one way or another uh, next Sunday, And uh, but I trust that you'll keep safe during this week. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Waterford House regulars will be aware that at Christmas time, our congregation are given the opportunity, if they wish, rather than giving Christmas cards to each other, to give a donation to a particular charity instead. This year, the charity that's been chosen for that is Caring for Life, a Christian charity based in Leeds that cares for the most vulnerable people in that city. It's also been our custom to have a special collection at the Family Carol Service that would go to a particular charity. And this year, uh, that collection is going to the Savannah Education Trust, a charity providing Christian schools in northern Ghana. Uh, you'll be able to hear more about the Savannah Education Trust at our Carol Service on the 20th. If you'd like to give towards either of these charities through the church this Christmas, please contact us at the email address on the screen to ask for our bank details so that you can make a donation via online banking. We can also tell you about other ways in which you can give if online banking isn't your thing. Please do get in touch to find out more. Thank you for your generous support. <laughs>